Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrative Coordinator and co-host of this program with Chairman Bill Gehring. And today is rather a special program. Not only do we have Ann Wonderjim, our Director of the Health and Human Services Department, but a special guest, Heidi Thompson, who is a foster parent and going to be talking somewhat about her roles and responsibilities. Nice to have you both here today. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to start with you. Please begin by sharing a little bit about the broad roles and responsibilities of the Health and Human Services Department. And you want me to do that in five minutes in or less? In five minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, Adam, we uh, consist of five major divisions, and those divisions are our Division on Aging, our Division of Economic Support, uh, Community Programs, and Heidi, of course, is very familiar with Community Programs, also being an adult family home provider our Division of Social Services, and you'll find out a little bit more about our foster care program in that division from Heidi. And then also our um, Division of Public Health, and we'll talk a little bit more about some public health activities. Um, as I've often said affectionately, we do everything from pre-birth um, with women who are pregnant all the way through death, where people who are low income and would not have the resources, we assist with burial and everything in between. Um, we're one of the three large departments in the county. Uh, we have approximately 200 employees and a 30, well actually now next year it'll be a $40 million budget and just about 11 million is tax levy um, that supports our department. We're probably somewhat unique in the fact that out of that budget approximately 67% are services that we purchase from organizations throughout the county in the community um, helping support um, the people we serve through those purchase services. So even though we have 200 employees, the majority of our budget is spent in purchasing services on behalf of our clients. So five divisions, about 200 programs, or 200 employees right. rather. And Anne is somewhat modest, not only the one of the top three largest departments, it's the largest department with over a $40 million budget. And she does a tremendous job overseeing a very complex area. Uh, recently, Chairman Gehring uh, led a prioritization process looking at all of our county programs and services and Ann came in with over 44 programs in that Correct. department alone. So there's no way we can cover it all in five or 30 minutes, but uh, Ann, how long have you been the director? And when you mention these five divisions, could you briefly give just a little flavor as to what they are responsible for? Sure, not a problem. Um, I think I've been director four years, going on five years. Um, I've been with Sheboygan County in one capacity or another since 1975. So it's been a long time and I've learned a lot through those years also. Um, I'll, I'll try to highlight just one kind of program from each of the areas to give a flavor of what we provide. In our Division on Aging, probably the most notable is our meal sites, our senior dining sites. We have nine sites throughout Sheboygan County. It provides a meal um, to our senior citizens and in addition to the meal, fellowship and activities. So that's a significant part of the services that we offer there. Um, as Chairman Gary knows, um, our Division of Economic Support not only provides the eligibility determination for uh, medical assistance, food share, but also we do the Wisconsin Works W-2 program, which is a, um, a non-mandatory program but very vital to our residents in Sheboygan County. Um, in Division of Social Services, we work um, very closely with a number of organizations in terms of keeping children safe, our Child Protective Services program, and also our juvenile justice programs, and we do that cooperatively with a number of um, agencies. Probably the most notable program is our STRIVE program with the Sheboygan Area School District, where we work with some juveniles who have some pretty severe problems and between the school district and our program, we're able to maintain them in the community in their own homes rather than the placement at Lincoln Hills, which would cost over $80 a day. So um, very beneficial program. In um, community programs, we have been working very closely um, with community agencies in terms of mental health and substance abuse programs and also our long-term support programs to keep people in their own homes. Um, and lastly, public health, and I'm now located on third floor, so I learned a lot more about public health, that not being my background. Um, just as I was leaving, people were coming in again for our WIC program, which is the Women, um, Infant, and Children program, to get their vouchers to um, get the basic nutritional needs met for their young children. So um, those are some of the areas. And I saw just a few um, vendors across the street as I was leaving, because we also work with the farmer's market with our WIC program. And before we turn it over to Heidi to hear from her, her a little bit, could you set the stage from a standpoint of the foster care program? 
I started out in social services, so I know a lot more about Heidi than she probably <laughs> would, would care for me to share, but um, oftentimes we have children that for one reason or another we can't maintain safely in their own home, primarily due to child abuse, neglect, or juvenile justice issues. And we need to place those children in a safe and nurturing environment. Um, there's a number of options, but the best option um, that's been statistically proven is with another family and sometimes relatives aren't available for that placement and so we go out and uh, recruit or I should say foster parents recruit us um, to open up their homes to these children. Um, they foster parents go through, I should say foster families actually go through an extensive process. It takes three to four months to actually get the license issued. Uh, the process is mandated by the state. Um, interviews of all the family members, background checks, uh, a visit to the home to check out the, the physical plant, does it meet all the code criteria, references, medical exams, we can go on and on. Um, and we have a coordinator that does that licensing process and, and works with our foster families. Um, right now, um, foster families are also required to complete a 36 training program, and Heidi knows a lot more about that than I do, as she is one of our foster parent trainers. And currently we have 51 licensed foster homes in Sheboygan County and that provides 105 beds um, available to us for placements. Um, some families will work um, only with infants, some families will take any age group um, and some of that changes over the years and many of our foster families also become adoptive parents for the children that are placed with them. Um, so it's probably one of the programs that's really close to my heart um, in terms of um, working with people who are truly dedicated to the care and well-being of children. And I'm so pleased that you suggested Heidi be here today because we have such respect and appreciation for the job that you that you do and you mentioned off the air you've been a foster parent for 30 years. Almost 30 years. And in addition to a foster parent also You've an adoptive parent, and we also have an adult. I'm an adult provider as well. Which is just fantastic. So Thank again, you. welcome. It's, it's great to have you here today. How does one go about, or specifically you, what got you interested in, in being a foster parent? Well, it was kind of interesting because we were a young couple and had two small children, and one day we opened up the Sheboygan Press, and there's this little article about fostering children and becoming a foster parent. And at that time, I think Dottie Brown was in mm -hmm. charge of the program and they had an informative meeting and we went. And I've always loved children and I came from a somewhat dysfunctional family and I thought, you know, maybe I could help these kids out. So we discussed and we made a decision to try foster care and it's been about 30 years now since we've been doing it. I'll be darned. Yeah. And for those 30 years, from your standpoint, what have been some of the, the challenges and what have been some of the rewards? I mean, what's it like being a foster parent? <laughs> well, there's highs and lows just like having your own children. And uh, the, it, the whole concept has changed so much from the beginning. When we first started out, it was more or less that you were a babysitter for the county. You took care of the kids, you know, and the county took care of their end. Now, over the years, it's much, much more involved. You become more of a professional. There's much more extensive training. The reunific uh, uh, reunification, trying to get these children back into their families, is pushed much more and at a much faster pace. Years ago, they had put the child in foster care and everything was kind of going well. They had a tendency, you know, to kind of leave the child there, which really didn't, you know, benefit anyone, birth family, child, anyone. And now they have it much more involved that they're trying to get help for all of the family and the foster child and it's a team approach. Everyone is involved now. The foster parent, the social workers, the birth parent, the foster child himself, depending upon their age. And they make a plan and everybody works on it. So it's a lot more support. Absolutely. There's so many more programs to help the children because these kids come with some baggage. You know, they have their issues because of what they've been through. And they have many more programs to help these kids and the birth families to help them be able to get their children back. It's not like they're you know, trying to take these kids away and, and keep them from the birth parents. They work very, very hard at trying to get these children back into the birth home that's where they belong, if at all possible. Now, Ann mentioned earlier that now, after all these years of experience, you are now one of the trainers, which right. has to give tremendous comfort to those who are new, getting involved with it. 
What's that process like? Could you provide a little bit more detail on that? Sure. The county has been blessed to have Joan Grunewald, who does the training. And she's great. She used to be a foster parent, but hasn't in a long time. And you get all these new little faces that come in, and they're all excited about becoming foster parents. And right. they um, really enjoy all learning all the things from the textbook. But boy, they sure love our stories. There's two other foster parents, Carl and Pam, that also help train. And we share with them the stories and some of the struggles that we have, or some of the thoughts that we're having. You know how it's pretty tough not to get attached. You know, you have a child with you two, three years possibly, and all of a sudden it goes home. There is a hole in the heart, and it, it takes a little while to, you know, work through it. And the different issues. Uh, the program is 13 weeks, and it helps prepare you for issues that come up. Rather than the old way of where, okay, something comes up, how are we going to fix it or how are you going to react? We have the training now so when the issue comes up, we can react immediately and take care of the issue becomes, before it becomes a problem. Are you seeing much interest in folks in this community wanting to become a foster parent? You say you'll have a lot of new faces in there and they're all with their eyes wide open mm -hmm. and learning, but is there a need for more foster parents? Always. There's always need mm -hmm. for more foster families. And the good thing about the training, too, is there are some people that come in with misconceptions on exactly what foster care is going to be mm -hmm. and how it's going to react with their family. And what we want, we don't want anyone going into it if it's not really what the entire family is willing to do. Sure. So it really gives them a chance to see how it's going to affect them as a couple, them as a family, their extended family, how that's going to react. And maybe it's not right for them. And then maybe we can direct them to a, a big brother's big sister program. Maybe they'd be better as a mentor or helping advocate for these kids. So it really is a good, sound thing to, to take these classes and find out for sure that you can make this kind of dedication that everyone in your family is willing to make the dedication. Because it takes a whole family to raise a foster child, not just one person in that family. Well, final question before I turn it sure. over to Bill. Uh, all of us sitting here, and I'm sure many of our viewers are parents and uh, have certainly had the challenges associated with being a parent as well as the rewards. And could you share, without breaching any confidentiality, um, one of the rewards of being a foster parent? You know, I guess one of the, the biggest things is being able to see these kids come in troubled and, and with issues and problems and to try and help them go through the steps of becoming a productive person in society. And they call and Mother's Day, I'll go down to the mailbox and maybe there'll be five Mother's Day cards in the box for me from girls that have left five, ten years ago. Or they call and say, I met my first true love. What do you think? And they want to share that with me. And it's the connection that stays with. I mean, it's a part of us forever, these girls. And apparently a lot of these girls were a part of their life. And it's, it's just neat that they call and, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm going to have my first baby or come to my wedding. And it just, just makes you feel like you've got one big extended family. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Heidi, on behalf of the County Board of Supervisors, I really want to thank you for years of service. You've done a lot for citizens, a lot for the kids of Sheboygan County. So I give you a hearty thanks for thank all you. that you've done. We've enjoyed it. And you will for many more years. <laughs> <laughs> many more. <laughs> okay. uh, turning back to you, Anne, uh, as I led the Pepsi process, I understood that foster care was a major part of what your department does. But there are about another 40 other programs. Right. And things continue to change. There are new mandates from the federal government, state government. Can you tell us about some of those changes that are coming down the pike that will impact your mm -hmm. department? I think probably the biggest change that I see right now is long-term care reform. And I use it as a general term because there's so much right now going on that is kind of lumped into that particular effort. Um, as you're aware, we've been working very closely with the health care centers in terms of the intermediate care facility uh, for the mentally retarded, the ICFMR. Um, in fact, as of yesterday, we have two people relocated from the ICFMR into the community. Um, and that is an initiative both at the federal and state level that individuals with a developmental disability residing in that facility as part of their annual review process, we look at moving them to the most integrated setting, which in most cases for most of those individuals will be a community setting. Um, so we're working on that. And in fact, met with Dale Pauls and, and Roxanne um, just this week in terms of strategizing um, for the balance of the residents and, and what we can do, and received a number of replies to our request for information in terms of service providers to provide those community-based services. So that's on the fast track right now. 
um, one of the initiatives. Um, in the governor's budget, as another part of long-term care reform, we have what's called the Community Reintegration Initiative, or CRI, CIR. Um, and we've had nine requests from the community without any publicity. This is in particular for elderly individuals currently residing in a nursing home who would like to relocate from the nursing home back into a community setting. It can be an apartment, their own home that they still have, or it could be in a community-based residential facility. Um, as I said, that one um, is new, and as more publicity comes out, I think we'll see more applications. That's voluntary on the part of the elderly person. It's not required. Um, and as of the end of October, we had nine requests, and um, so that program, as I said, is moving along quite quickly. Um, the last one that I just kind of like to touch on a little bit is called Comprehensive Community Services, and as everything has an acronym, this is CCS. Um, and that is a program that is developed specifically to work with people who have a severe and persistent mental illness to provide funding and support to maintain them once again in the community versus uh, institution or nursing home. And for those services that are social and rehabilitative in nature, we'll be able to draw down 60% federal funding. So it's a new initiative that comes with dollars, um, as does the relocation initiative from the nursing homes and also the ICFMR. Now the uh, health care centers department and the human services department have really been working fairly closely on the initiatives to move people to the least restrictive setting. Can you talk a little bit about some of the meetings that have gone on, how you're really working right. together for the best of the citizens? As I said, when we uh, met with um, the health care centers again this week, one of the things we always look at is when you're working with an individual, and, and for Rocky Knoll, the greatest impact will be that eventually the ICFMR uh, the new structure in Rocky Knoll will be closed down in terms of providing services to people with developmental disabilities and then the nursing home will look at converting those to skilled nursing home beds. We need to work closely with the health care centers because what we're looking at is what services, um, what types of things work well with an individual while they're residing in the nursing home that we can duplicate or at least um, try to duplicate in the community setting. So as an example, we've identified groups of people within the ICFMR who work well kind of as a family unit, um, as Heidi mentioned, even with foster care, so that we can maybe take four or five individuals and locate them in a group home or a small community-based residential facility in the community. So our meetings really focus on what's working for the individual, what are the ass assessed needs, how do we get the family support and the guardian support. So we're f focusing on that primarily at this point in time. Um, when we look at the community relocation initiative, um, there we're just helping all the nursing homes um, get information that this is an option available to residents on a voluntary basis. But I think as the healthcare centers look at downsizing, um, this becomes an opportunity then for individuals who are interested in relocating to the community to do that. So I see that as a real benefit not only to the resident who would like to move, but to the health care centers in terms of their downsizing plans. Thank you. Now, the Division of Health is kind of a division that keeps plugging along. It's not really high profile, but there are certain initiatives that they're working on. Oh. Could you enlighten us upon those? Mm -hmm. And I want to say I'm glad they're not high profile because <laughs> <laughs> that means something is probably going on in the community that we would prefer not to happen, like a foodborne outbreak mm -hmm. or um, cryptosporidium or, or something along those lines. So um, definitely when we look at public health, we like to keep a low profile. Um, I talked a little bit about the farmer's market because it's ending um, it, at the end of November in term, actually it's November now. Um, end of October, but um, during the summer months when that is in kind of the peak, we do what's called a vegging out program. And uh, there's a chef that comes in and he volunteers his time and he actually goes around and gets produce from the various vendors and does a cooking demonstration um, that is also taped um, for TV8. And it's just fascinating to watch how he can take very basic ingredients and, and make a meal. Um, of course, I talked a little bit about the WIC program, but we're also into immunizations. And um, as we know, anything we can do in terms of preventative health um, is important. And then as I mentioned, our planning for bioterrorism um, is always occurring in, in cooperation with our four contiguous counties that we're in partnership with. Um, and we work closely with emergency government also in that, that bioterrorism planning. 
bird flu seems to be the buzzword mm -hmm. today when you listen to television or read the paper. Mm -hmm. Have there been a lot of calls coming in regarding bird flu? We are trying to keep that one quiet, and there hasn't been. Um, but there's always a few. You know, there's always concern, especially if people are traveling overseas, they would like a little bit more information. And I do have to do a disclaimer that I'm not a public health official. I have a public health officer, but um, I did ask Dale Hippensteel, who is that public health officer, to provide me some information. So I did a little research on it, figuring that that's kind of a hot topic right mm -hmm. now. I think the real key here is that um, Government, believe it or not, is pre-planning for this, um, both through the CDC and the, the National Horse, um, Health Organizations and the World Health Organizations. Um, the transfer to humans is limited, but the potential is always there. And the one thing I found out in working closely with public health, viruses tend to mutate and change over a period of time. So one of the key things is, again, hand washing. Um, if you're coughing or if you're ill, not to expose other people to the illness. Um, just good practice in terms of food handling. Um, should this flu um, make its presence in the United States, one of the things people need to be aware of is there will not be a vaccine available for at least four to six months. Um, so that's one of the keys in terms of everything we can do to prevent um, any illness from spreading. We're going to be much better off than um, trying to treat it after the fact. Um, but we're not panicked. Um, we have a plan in place should it occur in the United States or in Sheboygan County. And um, you and Adam would both become part of that plan in terms of implementation because we would look at um, setting up immunization clinics um, on a broad basis once that vaccine would become available. Okay, thanks for that update. Adam. My, my wife last night uh, made a great meal of some fried chicken. and. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been feeding me a lot of chicken of late. And I don't know if it's just the news, the bird flu, or if she's trying to get things rolling here. Is she but, feeding uh, you sauerkraut on the side, too? Actually, as you can see, she's feeding me well. But we had a delicious meal. And speaking of birds, we've got Thanksgiving right around the corner mm -hmm. and the holidays. And I can't believe it's nearly mid-November here, and it's still in the 50s outside. Mm -hmm. and beautiful weather, although I think that's going to get colder in a hurry. And another thing about your department is uh, with the breadth of responsibilities and all the programs that you oversee and, and uh, that your staff provide, you have some real special activities over the holidays. Right. Uh, please share with our viewers a little bit about what's, what's coming up. I'm going to save the best for last. I'm going to start with some of our traditional type of things. We've once again been selected as a recipient of Festival of Tree uh, Money. And that's coming up on December 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And our staff volunteer, um, I'll be doing some volunteer work there, hopefully on Friday evening. But um, we would encourage our um, viewers to participate in that because it supports a number of worthy causes, including our department's Child Abuse Neglect Fund. Share the Spirit we do in cooperation with the Sheboygan Press. Um, primarily, that program benefits people who are elderly or have a disability. And uh, there will be little blurbs in the Sheboygan Press about different people and what they might like. And it ranges anywhere from they would like a box of homemade cookies to um, a trip to the mall, that type of thing. So I would encourage people there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something that's close to Heidi in my heart. We can always use more foster parents. And I have to read this because um, it's something that I, I can't just do off the top of my head. But we had a young foster child who wrote on January 27th, I'm going to be adopted, and I'm not going to be a foster kid. I'm going to be a kid. And when we really talk about what we do, it is helping children have a safe and nurturing, loving environment. Um, and this young lady who wrote that, it's very important to her that she's part of a family and has that permanency. So we can always use foster parents, as Heidi can attest to. And lastly, hopefully you can pan in a little bit, we have a group of young ladies who work with one of our providers, and it's the STARS program. And it's a mentoring after-school program for teenage girls who are having some real challenges in their life. Um, and it's a 12-week program. During every season, the girls work with their mentors, and they make different items that they sell. And that's how they support their activities and their outings and some of that. And Lori, who is the um, primary lead person for that contract agency, um, shared with me what they're going to make for the Christmas season. Um, and these are just, I, I, Heidi and I really like these, so we're definitely going to be buying these. They do light up, um, and they're just the um, block, gla um, glass blocks that people use for basement windows or showers and that type of thing. 
um, with a, a Christmassy or winter decal on, wrapped like a gift box, and as I said, they plug in and light up. Um, so actually, I have bought one of these, and I'm going to be dropping one off. Not for you two, though. It's for Dorothy, because Dorothy is the one that does all the decorations for your office. So, um, and has the good taste. Yes, that's true. So that's my little gift to you guys this year um, in terms of supporting the program. And then in the back, um, along the brick wall, they're also doing a, a snowman. And I'm hoping today, definitely, I was glad the wind was not bringing snow or rain. Um, that also has um, Christmas lights that it lights up and can be placed outside. Um, the nice thing is with the girls doing this, they collect different materials and stuff. So even though you see that one with blue, the next one could come with gingham. It could come with plaid. Um, they get fairly creative and, and really enjoy doing it. And as a department, we enjoy supporting them because um, the changes I've seen in some of those young ladies, because they come in and do community service work, um, is fantastic from when they start the program until when they end. And we only have a minute remaining. You've covered a lot of ground, a lot of important information. Viewers who are interested in the last information you just shared or learning more about becoming a foster parent or any other area that we provide, who would they contact? What's a, what's a good way to help the Health and Human Services Department be successful? Well, they can stop by if they would like to, and we're at 1011 North A Street. Um, for those long-term residents, that's the old Sheboygan Clinic. Um, or they could also call 459-3207. 459-3207. That's our main number. And depending upon what they're interested in, if they explain, the receptionist can get them to the right person. And if all else fails, they can always just ask for me and um, I'll direct them to the right place. Outstanding. Well, Miss Heidi Thompson, Ms. Ann Wonderjim, thank you so much for being our guest today thank and you. all the good information. And thank you for joining us. Next month, we're going to have our highway commissioner here, Mr. Roger Lanning, and he'll be talking about all the hard work that his staff do keeping our roads safe and hopefully uh, not hitting too many mailboxes. So we'll have Mr. Lanning in here. And until then, on behalf of Chairman Bill Gehring and myself, Adam Payne, and the Sheboygan County Board, thank you for joining us.